Okay, uh, let's make a start. So, uh, we're going to be talking about web services in the real world today. Um, so, for those of you who don't know me, uh, I am a consultant engineer specializing in DevOps. Um, I have been on production, release lead duties for far too long now. And um, I've been the junior contributor since around 2012. And yeah, I've got my master's in physics specializing in particle physics, which has huge amounts of practical applications to all my stuff I do in Joomla, for obvious reasons. Um, if you want to find me, I am available in all these places. Please do contact me. Please do feel free to ask questions. I will always try and answer to the best of my ability. So. I guess let's ask the first question. What is a web service? Um, simplistic terms, it's um, just a way for people to contact a server. Um, so people can come in with any sort of client, whatever that is, and um, ask the server for some sort of information, whether that's something deep down in the server or something that's application data and get some sort of information back or trigger some uh, an event to happen. I didn't, at its most simplistic terms, that's all it is. So, yeah. Uh, web services, uh, software used to communicate between two devices on the network. They can pretty much be in any format, any medium, with any data. Um, so, when you're getting started, when people say there is a true way of doing web services, they are wrong. There is a billion and one ways of doing web services, some of which are better than others, but most of them are very contextual and dependent on circumstance. So, yeah. So whatever Joomla does or doesn't do, doesn't mean it's right, doesn't mean it's wrong, it's just what's good for Joomla right now. And that doesn't mean so it's gonna be right for Joomla in 10 years time, but it means it's probably right now. And I put some examples of different ways that you can do web services here, so there's, uh, the top one is just some standard JSON. Um, the second one is some XML from an old IE program, which is kind of the predecessor to what a lot of people did for web applications. And then the bottom one is some SOAP requests, which if anybody has worked with before, I am sorry for your pain. So, um, kind of a brief history of web services. Try not to focus too much because it's not that important, but it's always interesting to know how all this stuff came from. So, obviously this is somewhat subjective, I built all of this up. So, um, way back in the beginning, in the early 90s, there was some things called remote procedure calls. These took definition files from C and uh, did some funky stuff, and it was with the aim of basically having connections between devices and networks. And it was quite... Uh, interesting concept at the time. And then some people came along and said, let's just do it to talk about uh, talk for data within the same system and basically destroy the entire communication ability, which was also kind of interesting, um, bearing in mind where we are now. Um, later on came XML RPC, which was um, created by Microsoft. And then immediately when they stopped people releasing, uh, that was because the they were blocking the release of SOAP and then immediately afterwards decided to go and release SOAP anyway. And then people kind of split on ideological grounds on what they wanted to use. And long and short, that stuck around for about 10 years. And then we got REST, which came up in a dissertation. And after all that came and went, they kind of came along. And I put rich and maturity model because it's an interesting concept of how web services evolve but it's not, strictly speaking, a history item in itself. Um, so yeah, and don't expect everyone to remember all of that. It's just a bit of backstory. So right at the end, I talked about this Richardson maturity model. So I thought I'd kind of go into that a little bit because I think it gives a really interesting way of seeing how you start with what's basically a website and go in, take it and become like a more REST application. 
And I fully admit I stole all of this from Martin Fowler's website because when I read this the first time, it made a lot of sense to me. And so hopefully it makes sense to you guys as well. Um, so for the starting point, uh, we'll start with trying to make um, requests. And so in this case, uh, the example is um, someone making, um, trying to book an appointment with a doctor. And um, so we start with what's borderline a website. You can imagine hitting new in Joomla for an appointment and getting a, a page back with a list of views of appointment times and selecting your appointment time and hitting save and sending it back to save it. And that's kind of what we've got here. We've got a couple of post requests, one to find a slot basically, get some information back on what slots are available. In Joomla that might be on a screen somewhere. And then we send a second point, uh, request back saying, give me this slot. Um, so the little sample request that we've got down here shows um, someone basically asking for a request slot with a doctor. I think the important things to note here is um, the structure of the URL. We're just posting to an appointment service endpoint with no real um, concept of really what's going on. All our information is located in the in the body, let's say, where we've put our dates and our doctors and all that kind of stuff. So um, that's kind of like level zero. That's borderline what a website looks like. Uh, so let's move up a stage. This is what they call level one. So it looks almost the same. But we've started to make some stuff. We've started to improve it a bit and make some changes. So we've started to write identifiers into our URLs. So if you look, instead of po uh, our first request being to slash doctors, it's now to slash doctors slash doctor name. Or uh, in Joomla, that might be um, uh, an article and an article ID. But you've started to put your IDs of your resources into your URLs, and you can already imagine that this might make things easier when you're looking at logs and transactions and that kind of thing to try and actually get a better idea of what's going on because in big request bodies you don't want to have to analyze the entire thing you want a high level idea of what's being going on and um, and that's really the only change here so you can see that we've got slots which have unique identifiers now for our appointment times and a doctor's name in our URL and that's the next step, that's level one. So with that in mind, let's move to level two. So in level two, we're gonna to start to move into introducing HTTP verbs. So who here knows the four main HTTP verbs used in Rust? Okay, so there's four main things used. So when you're navigating the internet, you're making get requests and post requests all the time. So a get request just is your page loading, and a post request is when you're submitting a form. And that is all you'll ever use pretty much when you're browsing the internet in the browser. When you move into REST, you start to go a layer down. You start to have uh, two more things, put and delete. Um, so what starts to happen is you basically have post, which is largely data creation, get, which retrieves data, a put, which updates data, and delete is, I guess, self-explanatory. Um, and so they map almost one-to-one -one with CRUD, which is your create, read, update, delete that you get in a typical website. And when we build a lot of our, M our typical MVC things in Joomla, you can imagine you're creating resources, you're updating resources, you're reading resources, and you're deleting them. Like all of articles and contacts and news feeds and banners, there's all those kinds of ideas. So in this case, we move to these things. So when we wanted to get the list of slots for our doctor, what we actually said was we want to um, read. So we send a get request rather than a post request. So instead of submitting a form to get there or something, we're just saying, can you give me a list of these doctor's appointments? So we move it to a get. However, the one thing with get requests is, is that you don't have data. You don't submit a body with get requests because they're a read operation. So you have to start submitting query parameters. And that's also why in Joomla, when you navigate around without SCF turned on, you've got all those big lists of query parameters because we can't submit it in the body. And it's the same in REST. So 
you can see under the get request there we've got a date we've now moved the date timestamp and the filtering based on status into the query parameters of our request and so that's kind of the next step we've kind of we've still got our url which is trying to get the information from dr m jones but we're now sending our request in the body when we actually want to book a slot we're creating an appointment and so then we send a post request still with our extra information in the other thing to note is that we start to look at what the status code of the server comes back with so in Joomla when you're browsing the internet you're pretty much always going to be looking at 200 requests every time you go and get a web page the browser comes back and says 200 okay and that's literally what the definition of the 200 status code is and there's a big massive list of valid status codes and if you look in Joomla's application layers you'll find that technically you're allowed to submit every one of them including the status code that is defined by the W3C standard as I am a teapot that generally exists and um, yeah so now in REST we start to look at these things in a lot more detail because they give us information about what the server's been doing so when we just did our get request we got a list back and we got information back and when it said 200 that just meant everything went okay here's your data when we submitted our post request to recreate our appointment we actually get back a 201 and 201 is pretty much the same as 200 it's it, but it says it's actually been created successfully everything in the 200 range normally means it went well everything in the 400 range means you submitted bad data and everything in the 500 range means something went really 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 wrong and the server has no clue why or maybe it does have a clue why but it's just trying to hide it up um, basically it means it's the server's fault rather than the user's fault um, and then for completeness 300 is a redirect range so you most people have come across 303s and 301s through Joomla redirects and um, 100 so kind of like intermediate codes for various activities but anyway so the important thing here is is that we've started to introduce status codes to give users back when they've submitted their request an idea of what activities have happened on the server and we've started to submit our data through the four restful verbs let's call them okay the final step to get to full what they call HATIOS compliance which stands for hypertext is the engine of application state and I promise that this is the last super super technical slide so if this is all going a bit over your head don't stress too much um, so the final step is to improve the kind of responses we got back so in a real restful world we actually want machines to be able to navigate through the web so instead of us saying go to get this list of appointments then the user has to say go and create our appointment we actually want to say to the machines these are your options available what do you want to do next and so in our response as well as submitting back our list of responses for each appointment slot available we want to say if you want to book this slot go to this link and then what that means is that if you want to start refactoring the way your rest works and the way your urls are structured you can do that and the user is never going to notice because they're just going to that whatever URL is returned back by your application. The only important URL is the first one you go to on the pay, uh, in the website. Which is sometimes more theoretical than it is practical because you find that so many URLs are entry, nearly every URL on your site is an entry point. But sometimes it can actually make a big difference depending on your situation and your use case. As I said, in all life, everything's contextual. Um, so I'll just show one more thing so in that place we just had a single link for a single slot but you can imagine it can get there can be a huge amount of metadata URLs that can be associated with just one entity you can have um, with us you know for example when you book your appointment slot you might then be given options to cancel it add tests associated with that slot change the time update your contact info get your own contact info get help all these things are different activities you might associate and all of these things should be things that your rest API gives back to you to give you things if it's there on a website it should be there in your API and there should be a mechanism for you to navigate it through all your URLs as I said it doesn't 
you don't need to know this inside and out and all the rest of it, but it it's a massive help if you understand some of these contexts because when you see these big JSON responses, it gives you an idea of why they're doing this, why they're producing these big complicated JSON blobs. Okay, so now we're ready for GraphQL. Moving on from REST, maybe. I've decided to keep it out of scope for now because I think I probably teched a lot of people out in here. Um, but GraphQL basically is, ultimately it's not too dissimilar to REST. You start to, when you, for some websites with massive amounts of data, you start to request that you only get back specific amounts of the data. That's the long and short of GraphQL. It's more nuanced, of course, but that's the biggest benefit. So for example, when you're using GitHub or something like that, and you get huge amounts of metadata back about each commit and all the rest of it, you can tell GitHub to just get the bits you want. And that reduces page load times because you don't have to retrieve so much data in the first place. But we won't talk about GraphQL too much. Okay, so let's go back to a bit more high level. Now we've kind of looked at some of the more kind of technical kind of things. So um, when we build APIs, there's actually different classifications of an API a website might use. So you have kind of public APIs, private APIs, and internal APIs. And all of these things actually have different use cases for a business. And a business might offer one or all of them or none of them, depending on what it needs to do. So I've kind of got a few examples of websites that are doing different things. and we'll kind of have a look at them and look at some what people offer and why they might offer it. So, but just to give you an idea, an external API is something that's freely available for the public to use. It might mean they have to sign up and get an API key of some kind, but there is no restrictions or limitations on that. A private API means that, um, the examples here, integration and business development, basically it's something where you have to go and conscientiously give a key to someone, or it might mean that your request to join the program has to be approved by someone, um, you know, because you're a business partner or something like that. Um, and an internal API basically means it's just for your business. No one else is allowed to touch it. And I'll try and offer you some examples of why all these three things are valid and available and all the rest of it. So let's look at BA's website, um, mainly used because I flew them to get here and so they became my example. Um, so um, any, this uh, is an API which anyone is open to sign up, register and use. You have to sign up and grab yourself an API key, but you can do it, it's free. Um, yeah, so yeah, don't mistake the fact that getting a key and registering for a key means it's not public because if someone had to go and approve my application and half the time rejected it because I wasn't a trusted partner, that would be when we move into private. But signing up and just getting a public key, that still makes it for what we're talking about here, a public API. And BA's API allows a whole bunch of things. It allows customers to access flight time, seat reservations, prices of tickets, um, tons and tons of useful things. Look at flight times, departing planes, airports, and all the rest of it. So if you wanted to, you could probably almost rebuild the BA website on your own just by using their website and their APIs, which is quite a cool idea. Um, and that was literally the idea behind it. When they opened it in 2015, this article started by saying, it's opening up to IT developers in a trial to find new ways for people to search and buy flights. And that's literally the idea, is that people can just build their own versions, and if BA like it, they'll probably just steal it. It's kind of cool. And so, you know, you can imagine that when startups and stuff are trying to start out in the world, then they might offer public APIs because they want people to buy in and toy and tinker and find cool ways to use their product. And if that's through online mechanisms, that's great. Um, there are also other mechanisms we'll come to later, but just as a kind of high level thing. Uh, another example of a, um, oops, I did not change my site title, private API is Google Flights. So this one is open for everyone to sign up, register, and what have I done here? I have no clue what I've done here. Have I screwed up duplicating? I probably have. What have I done? 
I have Nick live on the slide. Um, I think I've screwed up duplicating somehow. Whatever. This is a private API. The long and short of it is, is that Google Flights is a product that Google had bought in that basically allows you to um, basically it's a similar kind of website booking system, but obviously you've used Google Flight. A lot of people here will have used Google Flights on Google. But as you can see on the website, for inquiries about using the product, you've got to contact your Google account manager. And that's when we start to move into the private stuff. Google give it away for free to some people to try and trap them in. But if you want to go along and say, I want access, there is no chance. And that's kind of what a private API is. Trusted business partners try and hook bigger customers, but nothing more than that. And then we're going to look at internal APIs in a slightly indirect way. I going to use Netflix as my example of an internal API, but with a bit of a twist. So one of the other things that you've got to look at with an API is analytics. So when Netflix opened in 2008 and they started offering all their models, one of the things they did alongside it was this big public API, and people were very excited about this. It was one of many big companies at the time to offer a big public API. And in fact, a lot of people using it, I don't know how many people remember, but back then Netflix actually offered you to, they sent you out DVDs as well as having their online offering. And actually a lot of apps and stuff used this system to organize basically better versions of the app to download DVDs. Um, the DVD kind of side of their product sucked basically. Um, and it allowed also integrations of their online platform with various different websites, Rotten Tomatoes, Flickster, all these kinds of things. Websites to allow you to see which of Amazon and Netflix allowed you to view your films online and all that kind of thing. And the argument was always that less developers were required by Netflix um, because basically instead of Netflix having to go out and say to this comparison film site, oh, let us write this integration for you so you can come in and see whether we stock this film or not, Basically, a developer knew the API was there. They could sign up. They could just do it themselves. Less work required by Netflix. Jobs are good. Un. And I found this slide from December 2012, which was uh, very optimistically, I think, estimating that Netflix was saving themselves a billion a year through this. Um, and the reason I say optimistically is because the same year he produced that slide deck, Netflix shut down their public API. Um, basically, the reason was, and the reason why I'm talking about analytics on your API, is because people actually, um, you need to monitor who's using your API and why they're using your API. In the case of Netflix, it turned out that actually, by the time they'd shut down their DVD operations at this time in 2012, actually, no one was using the public API anymore. 99% of all their API volume was internal. And sure, they annoyed a few people and they broke a few apps, but actually within a year, pretty much no one remembered. Um, but yeah, so much for a billion. Um, so yeah, so one of the other things that's important to remember is to monitor your APIs, because when you are building APIs, you need to know who's using them, what the volume is, what the transaction rates are, not just for do you need to bring up new servers, but is it actually worth you investing your time into this stuff? Not every website is worth having an API. A lot of them do, but not all of them. So if you do offer an API system, monitor it. It's just like another website. And Google, unsurprisingly, has ways of doing this. Google has a, 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 it bought a product called Apogee in 2016, which is basically the, it's kind of an equivalent of Google Analytics for APIs. It's quite a cool system. Um, so yeah, so Netflix went from having basically a public API and moved it to an internal API. And so all their mobile products and all their tablets and stuff still use that API, but it's just not available to anyone outside of Netflix anymore. And a few select partners who they offer a limited private API to. So yeah, um, that's kind of the gist of public, private, internal. Public, available to anybody private, available to selected business partners, internal, just for you to use inside your own products to allow stuff to communicate with each other. Especially if you think about mobiles, it's probably the easiest way of thinking about it. 
Sure. Yeah. So this is a interesting article which basically said that they were getting two billion incoming API requests on peak days on Netflix. But it turned out that basically all of them were their own developers, it turned out. Their own mobile teams on who were running almost independently as standalone teams. And so the Netflix CTO basically shut the entire thing down and said, we're better optimizing our APIs for our own mobiles than it is for us to optimize it for everybody else. And there were different ways they could optimize the system and they could iterate faster if they didn't have to deal with the other people using the public service. So let's look at some use cases of APIs and things where APIs might be useful. And I thought I'd start with something that's a bit fun and jolly. Marvel themselves have their own API. You can register for free on the public service, sign up for an API key, and you can search by comics, you can search by heroes, you can search by all kinds of things. And it's quite a bit of fun, actually. I spent at least two hours when I should have been preparing this talk just playing around with their API instead. Um, but um, if we look at some of the things here, we can... For those of you who can still remember what I talked about, we can see that Marvel have actually built uh, quite a smart API. So um, we can see here that in our results, we've got um, resources for other things. So I've filtered here for anything that involves Iron Man. And as alongside all the information, I've got the name, I've got the description of the hero and all the rest of it. I can see that um, if I want to view um, a certain comic, here's the URL to the comic. And this is what we talked about with that maturity model and how products evolve. And you can see we're using full, um, we're using get and post. Actually, I've cropped out my photo, but we're using get and post requests and all that kind of thing. So actually, Marvel have got a really nice API and a machine would probably be able to find its way around with a size closed. So a bit of a more serious use case is replacing RSS feeds. There's kind of a reason these things have been slowly dying out. And part of that is because APIs do it except better. Um, so I kind of pulled out a couple of examples. The one on the left is a old BBC News R uh, RSS feed. The one on the right is a generic news API, which actually sources its data from a dozen different news websites. Um, but it enables you to do things that you just can't do on RSS feeds. So as an example, uh, JSON feeds basically can be parsed the same way by the same readers, except you get to do pagination, improved searching, rate limiting authentication, some writes if you want to allow people to submit data. It's kind of like, I mean, the writes is a bit more questionable. Normally your RSS feeds are read only, but the special pagination is being this long suffering issue with RSS feeds and how people deal with it. Basically on the server side, you just say the RSS feed is limited to 20 items and no one can do anything about it except turn to the next page. And our APIs and all that kind of stuff allow bunches of ways to deal with all these issues. And that's one of the reasons why RSS feeds have slowly died out is because APIs have basically superseded them. So, um, mobile apps. Um, it's probably the one that everyone talks about most in Joomla. Um, although my feeling is, is that um, I don't think there are going to be that many Joomla sites that benefit, probably the biggest 5% or whatever. However, um, I guess there are things that are important to note. Most internet traffic actually does come from mobile these days, so there are arguments. I mean, the invention of PWAs and stuff mean that it's less clear as to whether <coughs> um, you know, mobile apps will just completely replace the internet or whether the internet's going to evolve into these pseudo app like beasts of JavaScript anyway. Um, but they also allow you to um, basically get your content from the same sources and if you can get all your content through the same way, whether that's on your site, your mobiles and all the rest of it, you basically have less code, which means you have to pay developers less to maintain less, and you probably have less bugs, or at least everything's bugged the same way, especially if I'm releasing it. And so I came up with a really small demo just to give an idea of what it might look like on a mobile. So I used a little tool called Expo, 
Um, Expo is a wrapper on top of React Native for people like me who don't know how to build mobile apps, basically. Um, I don't know how to build mobile apps, so I learned. And it took me a bit of time, but it kind of getting there. So React, uh, who has heard of React? Heard. Okay, cool. React Native? Less people. Okay, so React Native is like, so React is a front-end JavaScript application developed by Facebook to build websites. React Native is a very similar tool that still runs on JavaScript, and it has a very similar structure, except it's used to build mobile apps and make them appear native in all browsers. And that means that you don't have to write Swift for iOS and C for, no, Java for Android. It compiles it all down for you into stuff that's appropriate and gives you the ability to distinguish what the app is. So for people that, do, uh, it obviously comes at the price, you've got a massive thwacking library doing the compiling for you, so it's not the most optimized ever. However, if you don't know how to code in Java or Swift, hi, then it's a nice option because I do know some JavaScript. So the nice thing about Expo on top of React Native is that it offers even more heavy libraries that allow you to do easier things like submit to app stores and just cooler ways of testing your application. So if I start up my little integration, then it boots me up this web page that tells me everything it's doing and it takes a bit of time because my laptop is really bad and it doesn't like being plugged into a screen and doing any sort of processing anymore. Um, it needs a new one basically. So the little QR code in the corner is a nice touch for me. So the QR code, if I want to, and hopefully this still works, um, if I scan it with my camera, I can open the app up on my mobile which is a feature that I haven't found anywhere else yet. Um, if you want to do it on your mobile, you basically have to sign up to Apple developer programs, download the app, and especially if you're doing React Native. And this is the main reason I picked Expo on top. You have to sign up for a free account, which is kind of annoying, but actually I get the ability to customize everything um, and just open it up on my phone, my girlfriend's Android and whatever have you, and just test it on the fly and then submit to the App Store, which is kind of nice. Not that I've submitted this to the App Store. But, so, um, we will open this up so you guys can all see it in the iPhone simulator on MacBook. Um, and it's gonna think about it because it's my laptop. Always. Come on, you can do it, little baby. Come on. Oh my god. It's so much slower when it's plugged into a screen, it's unreal. Hey, there we go. So this is going off to my local host, Joomla the site, and getting the list of all the articles on the site. And, um, okay, that one has no text apparently, but let's, there you go. Here's one that has text, and just renders the text to the article. And um, bearing in mind that's HTML, that's not as simple as it would sound. That took me almost a day on its own to find the right thing to display the HTML output. But um, so yeah, it's like a cool little thing. And basically, um, I can do that with three files. I have um, an entry file, which basically just defines my two screens, my articles screen and my articles screen. Um, and the navigation between them is just this. Um, I have an articles screen, which is my list of articles. It goes off to my Joomla site um, and goes and gets the content API and then does the request and then renders it as a list item view. And list item is going to come out as a kind of native list on any supported mobile device, which is give or take all of them, depending on what you're doing. Um, and I just add pen my text, my latest articles text, which was here. Um, and display a list and then a button that allows me to go into more detail. And then in my article view, whoops, that's not the one. My article view, I have a similar thing. I get the item, I pass it through from the list view into the state. 
you can imagine it like a browser session, I guess, and render the article and title, the created date, the HTML view, the button. So it's fairly simple. And if you want to start making it more complicated, then you can. You can say, I want to go. So the article view, the article API is only going to give you back a category ID. So I can then go and get more information about the category. So if I do this, it does a live reload, which is nice. And so in my item screen with category, I go and do an extra API request. I go and get the category from a category ID that I get from my article API. And with a whole bunch of extra code, go and print out the article category title. And you can see now I've got category plugins on my little mobile app. And this will basically work in any half modern Android or iOS device. And it's three pages of 100 lines of code, which is about as simple as you can get, I think. Or either that or I'm coding it wrong. But yes. Yes. Ah. So the question was, um, was we getting, are we getting JSON from the API? And the answer is yes. I can show you what the, a the API looks like. This is what the phone was receiving from my local host. This is also going to my local host. Does everyone here know what Postman is? Yes, maybe. Yeah. Okay. So it's for the, anybody who didn't want to part their hand and sort of say no. It's basically a small little thing you can use to make API requests to anything, and it saves all your configuration. You can also save environment settings so that you can make the you don't have to repeat the the API request you're making between different servers. Um, and it also displays it in nice, pretty formats, and you can add optimizations in based on whatever. So. This is what I'm getting back from my articles view. My categories one is fairly similar. If I do like um, category slash 25, I'm going off piste, which means it's inevitably going to, yeah, categories. Yeah, there we go. And there's the information for my categories. <clears throat> yes. Uh, we're not going with JSON LD. We decided to go with JSON API. Um, so, yeah, the question was basically is that it, it looks very much like a database? And the answer is yes. I mean, obviously, some of the stuff probably, like, all this information needs to be tweaked a bit. So, like, the level and left and right values are almost certainly unnecessary. Um, but it also comes down to starting to add in these links to related resources. That's kind of how JSON API functions. It's not necessarily about what your item types are, but it's about starting to refer around. So for example, although I'm specifying a parent ID and the attributes here, I could, rather than just display a raw value, say um, more informational links would be going to uh, pet, you know, the categories slash 19 URL. Um, Yes. Um, so we looked at all the different options for what we wanted to do in terms of response formats. We actually documented this all because um, API response formats is always the contentious subject of the week. Um, and there's a whole bunch of descriptive text here. Um, this is all at, sorry, uh, Joomla projects .github .io gsoc 19 web services. Um, this is actually not just the GSOC 19 web service project. This is the 2017, 2018, and 2019 projects all combined into one website. And we try and document the decisions we've taken and the actions we've taken so that when people come back in five years, they at least might have an idea why we made decisions rather than be totally clueless and blame us for everything. Yeah, of course, they'll still blame us anyway, but at least there's an explanation. Um, so long and short of it was that we've thought that for people who may not have come across an API before, the documentation for JSON-LD compared to JSON API was relatively complex. Bear in mind, this table was also written two or three years ago when we first started out on this project. So 
I have no clue how Jason LD's documentation has evolved since then. It's possible that now it's the best documentation ever. But you've got to go back on the, you know, what the best option was at the time. And for us at the time, the best option was JSON API. Um, there are various other things about JSON API that are nice. One of the other things that was nice for us was that there was a library for JSON API support that operates in a very similar way to how our internal J document class worked. And that made integration significantly simpler. Um, okay, but so yeah, mobile apps, that was just more just like me, get, I get to play around with some stuff and have some fun. I mean, I'm not saying write your code the way I've written it. And there's definitely because I'm using React Native and Expo on top of that going to be performance hits you get as your app started to scale. But if you just want to build a small little whatever for a smaller site, it's more than fine. Um, and it's really simple to use, or at least it was in my experience. Um, so, um, on a related note to mobile apps um, and talking about single sources of data, which is kind of where I was before I started doing demos, um, we have, um, you can actually start to save money by scaling your application in different ways, having specialist services um, that give optimized um, <coughs> You can have optimized um, request and responses for different apps. Netflix use this extensively. And I'm not going to go into it a lot, but if you're interested in how you want to start optimizing on different apps, read up on how API gateways work. This is from the Microsoft docs. I found them pretty good, but I've also built them before. Um, yeah. So uh, another use case you can use APIs for is syncing your staging and your product, your product applications. Um, in many sites, you have demo areas, but you've then got to synchronize your content, which can be a struggle, especially with Juma's lack of multi-site support. You can actually probably start to build very viable um, services to do multi-site now after you've put in APIs, because you can eventually will be able to access all your data through the API. And so you can start to synchronize between sites with the right components. Um, Another more interesting one is the Joomla download site. This used a very early prototype of what became the Joomla API. Um, I don't know if you, anybody here has ever actually tried using it, but um, I see at least one person nodding. So um, here he's right at the front. Um, so you can basically use um, a system called OpenAPI to do documentation. Um, if you use certain uh, request and response formats, it's super cool. Um, Open API is a really nice standard. I've been using it for several years now. Um, trying to use it in Joomla is going to be a push because we have a lot of dynamic request response properties, especially with custom fields. So it's not going to be shipped with version one of Joomla, but I fully intend on in later versions trying to make it work. Um, and then there's a tool called Swagger. There is also a ton of other alternatives. Swagger was the original though, because the original Open API project used to be called Swagger. And then it kind of split and the standard became open API and the docs formatting part became stayed with Swagger. And open API is used by a whole bunch of people like uh, Microsoft, Google, and all that stuff. Um, but yeah, it allows you to build really nice docs. Marvel were also using this, by the way. Um, uh, integrations with other websites. We talked about um, public APIs and what they might be used for. And I think probably the most obvious thing I can think of is event booking sites. If you're, if you're creating events and trying to share your events on as many of the networks as possible, of course, you're going to sign up on Meetup and all these kinds of websites. But also, um, if you just put your site online, then other people can come and just hook the data out. Um, this example here was, um, I think, the Ticketmaster API. And that means that anybody who wants to filter down on Ticketmaster events by certain categories and stuff can just hook it out and um, go through it. And they, you can do it for tons of different styles of events and all that kind of thing, where you're wanting to pu publicize your events to the biggest amount of people possible. And in some ways, an API is the biggest amount of people possible because it's almost unlimited in terms of scope. Um, and yeah, that also used OpenAPI to format its docs. Notice the theme here. And finally, I think this is my final one, Alexa. All Alexa skills are hosted in the cloud on functions. 
which um, in the case of Alexa and the lambdas are actually running HTTP REST APIs. So if you do want to build your own little Alexa skill, and in some ways, especially given that Alexa and all the, uh, the Google and Apple equivalent are in the world of single answer things, you kind of want to because you want people when they ask a question to get the factual response from your site rather than somebody else's site. Um, especially if you're not spreading misinformation. Um, so it's a really interesting use case and um, having your Lambda go off to your site and getting the data from your API is going to be really trivial. And also the Lambdas themselves. And so with kind of a few use cases and because I'm rapidly running out of time, um, I've just wanted to look at how kind of APIs evolve a bit in the CMS world because API has been around for a while now and there's other CMSs, newer CMSs generally, not the kind of legacy three, so to speak, the WordPress, Joomla, Drupal world that have had them for quite a while. And it's been really interesting to see kind of how the CMS market has kind of evolved a bit. So I guess the first one and kind of the most interesting one is um, headless CMSs. So these have dynamic backends which are often hosted by third parties, um, wherever, and just have an API to expose your data. So basically, you're devolving away the responsibility of building your pretty backend to somebody else, and then you just have to build a front end for it. And you get all the data out the front end, and some people, there's kind of two different ideas. Some people just use Jamstack, which basically means JavaScript, API, and your HTML markup. And they basically build static sites out of it which is obviously about as optimized as you can get because there's nothing to do. However, some people are still using React or Angular or Vue to go and dynamically get the data down so they don't have to rebuild the site so much. It depends how you want to optimize. Um, I think the best example I found of this at the moment is Contentful. And for anybody here who remembers uh, Reuven, who was a junior contributor about, well, I don't know, four or five years ago, he went on to become a dev advocate there. And the stuff they do there is really interesting, but a very different concept to Joomla. Um, and the other thing that you can get from this is basically just full separation between what I call backend and frontend. And I don't mean backend and frontend in the Joomla sense. I mean backend and frontend as in having a server that hosts all your data with an API, and then a frontend that's basically just JavaScript that's entirely independent of that. In most corporate environments these days, you find that so that they can employ specialist front end people who just know JavaScript and CSS and HTML and specialist back end people to produce the data and in a sane format. Um, and it also, as we already discussed with the kind of having an API allows you to have different back ends, different front ends. And with that, questions, because I am running really over time. Questions? Yes. Um, if you are uh, getting information out of the Joomla database, yes. uh, this API, um, can you also uh, use the authentication of Joomla, the user? Uh, yes and no. Um, we don't use the traditional authentication plugins because um, cookie plugins and stuff are obviously totally unacceptable in the world of REST. So there's a new group of plugins called um, API authentication. <coughs> um, right now, that's just basic core using your Joomla username and password. That will change before it goes stable. But yes, you will be authenticating with your user account, and there should also be an a kind of like system account. So if you're trying, if the website's trying to make requests to itself, think Media Manager, where we already basically have a f uh, view app trying to connect to an API, which is just itself. Confinder would be another good example, then you don't want the user to have to write in their username and password again because we're not going to save their password in a session or something every time. So you want like a system token of some kind that is always allowed and can access everything unfettered so that when you're browsing your site, it can get all the information down. Okay, cool. Anybody else? No, Robert's telling me no. I'm, I've been overruled. Um, if you want to help us out with the API, PBF, October the 19th, please do help. I'm always around to give people ideas on what needs to be developed in the API. There is a ton. Thank you.